Welcome to the No Plateau Podcast. For stroke and brain injury survivors, their caregivers, and the therapists helping them to break boundaries in their recovery journey. Hosted by Henry Hoffman, a certified occupational and clinical therapist, and Pete Duran, a certified podcast host. CPH, look it up. This podcast is intended to supplement stroke and brain injury survivors' recovery journey. Therefore, all content affiliated with this podcast is for informational purposes only and is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another thrilling episode of the No Plateau Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Pete Durand, uh, alongside Henry Hoffman, who is the brainchild behind this whole thing. Uh, hi, Henry. How are you today? Good, Pete. How are you doing, man? I'm doing great. We've got a special guest today. We have Dorothy, a.k.a. Doro Zuliger, uh, from the NeuroHub on with us today. How are you, Dorothy? I'm good. Thank you. Thanks good. for having me. Well, I appreciate it. Uh, I appreciate it because Doro asked me what kind of bourbon I had in, in uh, my little jar behind me. So we had that discussion before we recorded. We'll leave that for a separate podcast episode. But it shows Sounds she's like- paying attention. <laughs> Every time I zoom with Pete, I always look at that bourbon to see what's left based yeah. on the week we had. He's monitoring nice, my, nice. He's, he's monitoring the levels in there. So, Just the stress level, yep. So Doro, I think one of the reasons you were one of the first guests we wanted to have in the program is that uh, I believe you and Henry are like-minded when it comes to neurotherapy. Yes, I, I hate, would say that, so. If that's not a compliment, <laughs> I'm really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So, you said when it comes to neurotherapy, which is right. the differentiator there. But <laughs> Doro and I are like-minded when it comes to whiskeys and bourbons, though. So we've, we've got the whole program covered. It's, it's all good. We connect yep. somewhere, somehow. So what you know what we want to do on the program, and I think uh, our, our listeners would agree, is we want to push conventional thinking when it comes to neurotherapy and whether it's TBI or stroke rehab. A lot of the, a lot of the science, a lot of the protocols, a lot of the approaches are, are years old right? They're just, they're, they're old and any industry tends to evolve. So we want to try to probe into things that push the envelope a bit, maybe get people to question what's been out there and ultimately help, you know, stroke survivors and and those with a TBI recover quickly and uh, return to a a better life. So Henry, I'm going to turn this over to you and, and let's just get into it and have Doro kind of share with us some thoughts, things she's seeing out there and you can guide us with some questions. How's that sound? Sounds great, Pete. Why don't you just relax, uh, get a bourbon on rocks, and enjoy the show. All right. Uh, Doro, Doro, good to see you as always. And for the listeners, let's start off with just getting a brief intro. Um, obviously, by the way, happy OT month, fellow colleague. Thank you, thank you, same and, to you. Yep, thank you, thank you. Uh, so what would be great is if you can kind of share a, a brief journey about uh, basically uh, your background and okay. how you got to the point you're at now, which is the beautiful NeuroHub. Okay. Well, um, I've been an occupational therapist for the last 11 years, and I started out in neuro rehab right out of school, an outpatient, and I've never gone in a different setting. Um, And after four or five years of working in an insurance-based setting, I realized that there's a need for clients to be treated past discharge. We had so many clients that um, wanted more, but we had to discharge them because of functional plateau or because of insurance benefits and insurance limitations, but there is no local resource. So at the time I needed to be more flexible since I had two young children. And I said, all right, I'll be the one that sees these people. And I started the NeuroHub and it's right. grown ever since. <laughs> yeah, we started. Yeah, so you're based in in Florida, right, Orlando, right. Florida, yeah. We started, it was just me and three or four clients a week. And now we have one, two, three, four, four clinicians um, on staff and a driving program and a CIMT program. And we're just starting the pediatric CIMT program this mm-hmm. summer. And yeah. Wow, that's great. Congratulations. That's, Thank you, know, you. A lot of OTs aspire to be you when they grow up. And that's wonderful that you dipped your toe in the entrepreneurial world and you're, you're very successful. So congratulations. Thank you. So let me transition to um, taking a real life scenario and we'll talk about our brain injury clients that you see on a daily basis. 
And I think of the patients I've had in the past, and I think about their journey and their um, complaints. You know, it's, it's in a difficult, difficult journey for them where they get thrown into this hospital system with a stroke. They never asked to be a stroke expert. So now they have to learn everything about the stroke recovery process. That usually does not go well. Then they get catapulted into outpatient or home uh, care. And a lot of these patients are in rural communities. So they're not going to have a neuro hub next door. They're not going to have a lot of these wonderful hospital systems next door. So now they have to become their own expert, their own advocate. And it's just gut-wrenching to know that that still exists in modern times, right? So if you could uh, rip up the neuro rehab delivery model book and start over, what would be some of the changes you would make for these poor souls when they get admitted into this acute system, go through the hospital system, get discharged, go to outpatient, lost in the system, on Google 24 seven, trying to figure things out, what would you do differently? Oh, that's a that's a loaded question. There's so many things that could be done better. I don't want to say they're bad, but it could be done better. Um, I think the start is insurance. Mm. I, I like insurance. I appreciate insurance and what they do. But what's really hard for me as a therapist is to get somebody with a TBI or CVA. And after 20 visits, they're done for the year. 20 visits might work great for a rotator cuff repair to right. mope them a little bit and gain range of motion. But 20 visits after a stroke, I mean, that just gets you warmed up. Right. So I think um, insurance company should take a good look at diagnosis and severity of injury versus just assigning you got 20 visits a year. And some, some insurance companies obviously are better than others, but that's a huge one where, you know, um, Joe Schmo comes, gets his 10 visits, and then he gets discharged. And then what? There's no carryover, there's no guidance, there's nothing. And I think that's where it's so important that all the clinicians in the different settings start to collaborate more so we have a better handoff and provide better guidance for the clients and more like a, yeah, almost like a roadmap in recovery. Yeah. Um, what should be next? What can I expect? How do I look? How, do, how can I advocate for myself? That's the hard part. They're so overwhelmed. I mean, their life has been flipped upside down. And now they're, like you said, you know, expected to be stroke experts and there's just no way. So I feel like that's on us therapists to provide them with all the resources that are out there to, to at least navigate a little bit better mm -hmm. through that territory. Yeah. You know, Doro, I think one of the things you said in the beginning is, and I, I wrote this down in quotations is I will be the one who sees these people. That's why, that's why Henry and everyone else recommended we speak with you because honestly, that's not, that's not how everyone feels right? It's, it, this is a job, but for you, I believe it's a job and a calling. Yeah. Yeah. The problem is, and, and, and that's a good point, Pete, and, it's, and it takes special therapists to do that. Um, Dora, you, you hit the nail on the head. The problem is this matchmaking system, right? Yeah. So, you know, the folks that see you not necessarily are down the street, right? People come from all over to yeah. find experts. And so I always feel sorry for not the coastal towns, but the middle America, right? Absolutely. So let, let's say someone in Ohio or, or Idaho uh, suffers a stroke. You brought up a couple of good points. One is education. They don't know exactly what to know. And so they don't realize what the recovery process is going to be like. They don't understand that they are going to have many plateaus, but they can break through those plateaus. Correct. And they don't even understand what the research supports. Correct. You would think by now there would be a true source that is given to every admit that provides them with um, how to uh, understand, to identify research and, and understand what's effective and what's not effective. Yep. Um, how to then, when you're discharged, Instead of saying, Mrs. Jones, where do you live? And we'll find the closest therapist to you. You know, that's not the case. So if, if the closest therapist is a general orthopedic therapist and you're a stroke patient, that's not a good match. Mm -hmm. So there needs to be a better way. And if I had to rip the book up, it would definitely be uh, finding a matchmaking platform that would allow patients to easily identify Doros right? Easily identify neurotherapists who can help, who understand the latest in evidence-based practice, understand how to break through these plateaus that patients will receive, understand it's going to take more than three hours per week of therapy. So it'll need to be intensive, right? 
And the other thing I would do is, you know, this is my personal opinion. You may not share this opinion, but I think robotics are overhyped as one example. So if you think about robotics, did, you know, there's 3000 RCTs that exist on um, uh, stroke recovery. And the number one at the top of the list for the most RCTs is robotics, 112 as of last month. So if there's 112 RCTs on robotics, the question then becomes, what is the ultimate goal of robotics? Is it to be in everyone's house? Is every, every individual going to have a robotic, robotic device in their home to help them do the task training they need? Well, you know, that's not possible. Right. So maybe we should invest more of our research dollars into very affordable, low-tech items that patients can actually have access to. That'd probably be the other gripe I have with changing the system. What say you? Agreed. Like, I would 100% agree with what you just said. I think if there was such a thing as like an online platform that can be provided to a stroke survivor upon discharge or even in the hospital, you know, they get educated on using it and they go through their steps like a, like a roadmap to recovery. Here, you're an outpatient now or you're an inpatient. This is what you can do at home. This is what you can do, or almost like a flow chart. This is what you can do if you don't find an outpatient therapist. Here are the exercises. Here are videos how to do it. Here's how you can check your progress. All these little things that nobody would know unless they've had a stroke before or worked with somebody. Yeah, I think um, super important. And then resources, things they can do at home and can afford at home. Super important. And Pete, what's funny is uh, you come from the health and wellness world, the non-stroke world originally, where things like that do exist. But it, for sure. some reason, when it gets into uh, stroke recovery, we feel like we're decades away. Well, uh, not only that, but Dora, I'm, I'm curious about this because you mentioned something really interesting, right? If, in, if insurance covers 20 visits and then you're out, um, I know for a fact that well-being, you know, whether it's exercise, nutrition, you have to put the work in. But compared to what a stroke survivor is dealing with, it's nothing, right? Correct. You, when you, when you, and, and Henry has educated me, right, with the right books and things to, to come up to speed on, on what our clients and patients deal with. But when you're speaking with someone and you talk about this roadmap or this guide, how do you help someone get around the fact that this isn't 10 visits or 20 visits or 10 reps or 20 reps? This is thousands of repetitions over an extended period of time where they may not be able to see progress, you know, day to day, but you can, if you see them in a right. period, how do you, how do you set those expectations? And then how do you continue to provide the encouragement? I mean, which is a big part of your role. Yes. So I usually, um, at the evaluation, I tell clients and their family members that I look at therapy as a 20, 80 split. Mm -hmm. I support them 20%. They have to put in the 80%. Then we look at different we kind of take their whole environment into consideration. What can they do? How much support do they have at home? Some people can't do anything at home. And then we just recommend that they have to go to therapy more in order to see progress. Ah, okay. um, I mean, if, if that's what they want, that's where the intensives come in. Where we see them five hours a day for three weeks to kickstart it. Um, right. And usually once, once the client sees that there is hope, there is a little bit of progress, that's when, when they buy into therapy and um, we usually see a good carryover to home program. Ah, excellent. excellent. Well, that, Doro, that brings up a good point regarding just patient education and, and, and just dealing with that important, being their advocate and their resource. So what, what should every patient or family member that you encounter, what should they be asking regarding their stroke? I mean, what are the top things that they should be asking that they wanna know after a stroke and from your perspective? Well, first of all, usually a client comes to us and they know which side of the brain the stroke was on. But then when we ask exactly what area the stroke was in, they don't know. So I think that's where phys physicians should start to educate them, okay, it wasn't the thalamus or this area of the brain, which then explains a lot of their symptoms a lot of times and, and predicts um, the path of recovery. I think that's a really important one. Then educate yourself on what kind of treatment options are out there and see how you respond to them. Some people don't even know that mirror therapy exists and can be beneficial. There's a lot of places that only use one or two tools and devices, you know, like e -STEM and and some hand strength thing or something like that. I feel like learn about all the tools and treatment options that are out there. 
ask about the experience that the therapist has. And then I would go almost beyond that recreating movement. I would say, how, how do I heal the brain? I think that's a really important one where you take more into consideration than just movement exercises, um, but you take in consideration sleep, the importance of sleep, the importance of nutrition, the importance of emotional well-being and stability, your family support system, all those things, because you can, you can do great in therapy, but if you don't get any sleep or not good sleep, quality sleep that you need for your brain to heal, if you eat crappy food and throw everything out of whack, your progress is going to be so much harder and slower. I guess I'm not going to be in a good position then for uh, a good outcome if I have a stroke, huh? <laughs> Wait, are you telling me you're not eating good or you're not sleeping? Uh, lately, <laughs> lately, the diet's been pretty bad and the sleep's been pretty bad, but we'll, we'll turn that around. Yeah, turn it around. Those points are good points. And when I think about the patients that walk in and, and I've worked with over the years, you know, a light bulb goes off for some of them when you explain the Brunstrom stages of recovery. And for folks that yeah. don't know the Brunstrom stages, uh, it's just basically uh, Brunstrom is a Swedish born phys physiotherapist who created a wonderful therapist who created the uh, seven stages of recovery. But in a nutshell, it starts from completely flaccid or floppy limb all the way to normal movement. And you actually ride it through from flaccid to some movement to you must have spasticity to get to the next stage to then you break out of spasticity where you now show some independent volitional movement in patterns that are not considered quote unquote synergistic. And what's crazy is I'll say to patients, let's, I'll, you know, on a whiteboard or, or, or I'll show them on a computer. Here's where you are. You're a stage two. We want to get you to stage three. And then we want to get you to stage four, because sometimes I think people are upset and frustrated when they have spasticity and they don't realize that that's part of the normal recovery process. Correct. As one example, that's one thing I think uh, folks don't realize is spasticity is actually a good thing for a little bit. Obviously, it's not the end result, but at least, you know, for many, they're not stage one, which is flaccid. And so, so I walked them through that process. The other thing that's always an eye opener for them is when I have to explain the repetition uh, journey that they need to go on. Uh, because they, in the beginning, they're, they're, they're freaking out when I tell them they got to do, you know, hundreds of repetitions per day to show any benefit. But then I say, let's take a step back and just think about what we do throughout the day. Is it really that challenging? And then, and then they kind of, you know, uh, realize it's not that big of a, a feat there. Um, have you noticed those tend to be issues as well? The stages of recovery for these individuals and, and the rep count, if you will? Uh, stages of recovery more so than the rep count. Rep count, they're used to by now. They know the importance of it. And we like to tell them here, it's like, okay, if you don't do the reps physically or actively, then we want you to visualize it and go to visual yeah, visualization reps. techniques because that's still reps. We know it still fires uh, the same areas in the brain, more so the spasticity. That's really frustrating for a lot of clients. You know, once, once that nasty spasticity sets in <laughs> and we can't get out of it quick enough, um, that's a toughie. Mm -hmm. That's interesting that you said that most of your patients know about the reps before they come to you. That's, that's shocking from my perspective. Well, we, we put it out right away. Like once they come, right. that's one of the first things. Got we it. Okay. Yeah. I thought they came with that knowledge because it's amazing how many people come day one and, and don't know a lot, which, don't know. which right. says a lot about the health system and the education they're getting early on in their, in their recovery process. Correct. But, I mean, how many reps do you get? in a standard inpatient setting per hour, 40, or for 45 minutes, what do you get? The research actually shows that they get on average 30 repetitions per OT yeah. session. Yeah. And you are not doing much with 30 repetitions. No, that's uh, a waste day, of, trying to waste get of time, back. waste of money, waste of hope. Yeah. Yeah. When you think about the seven stages, and this is probably for both Henry and Doro both, but I'll start with Doro. And, and again, it's so hard. Every stroke patient is different. Every stroke survivor is different. But when you're setting those expectations, and we'll just say an average stroke, right? Someone that's struggling with some OT issues. How long can they expect to be in each stage? I mean, when you set that expectation, are you, you know, are you helping them say it's weeks, months, or you just can't tell, right? Is that, is that part of the, is that part of the expectation is we just don't know? That's my answer. It's like, it depends. There's no, I personally, I can't put a time frame on it. I think I'd be a millionaire if I could. Everybody would want to know, but it, it truly depends. And then it, 
again, all these other factors play a huge role in recovery. Yeah. And I, and I think when you, by the way, that is the right way to approach it, right? It is, is to let them know right up front, there's no roadmap here. There's things we're going to do to get you down the road, but you're different than the last patient I saw. Yeah. We never know you, how long it takes. Yeah. And I think you hit it right in the head, you know, your nutrition, mm-hmm. your, your emotional and physical support at home, your, your access to care, how often you can get here, all those kind of things factor into everyone's recovery. And I think the other one that I've noticed is their willingness to do the work, right? Right. They've got to do the work and do the reps and coming from the fitness world. Very few people are. <laughs> yeah. So I guess I'm lucky on that one since we don't work with insurance companies here at the NeuroHub clients want to be here and want to come. Mm-hmm. So if we don't pump out the 250 reps, they're going to, they're going to be upset with us. They're going to go, I have three more minutes. I want 80 more reps. Yeah. Wow, that's yeah, well, that's part of the whole, you know, first of all, they're, if they're coming to you, they're internally motivated. It's a cash Absolutely. based program. So they're yeah. internally motivated. They're coming for a reason, you know, and, and they want to bombard their brain with stimulation through all the different ways you're going to help them. And so that's, that's the beauty you have, you're getting typically the cream of the crop when it comes to motivation. Uh, and they're willing to put the hard work in and they understand that the road is a long road. And so I think those are the those are the good points that are, that are important to kind of have with those clients when you first see them. Of course, they're going to see those micro changes with insurance companies, Doro. It's all about those short-term and long-term goals, which are kind of fluffy ADL independent goals. The way I look at it is, yeah, it's good to have long-term goals. And of course, uh, Pete, it's a classic example. A, A client will come in and say, I want to learn how to play the piano. Our question immediately will be, have you played the piano before? They'll say no, and no. Like, that's not probably a good long-term goal. No, just kidding. So, but sometimes you do get those funny ones. But you have your long-term goals, which are you know, client will be independent with uh, you know, uh, making a uh, uh, a grooming task or doing a cooking. Okay, and the short-term goal is going to be to have them do some of those specific sub goals of cooking. The problem is for most clients, and that's all because of insurance. And the problem is for most clients is it's even hard to achieve those short-term goals. So I like to have these micro goals, which are not even short-term goals, which are a, a, a wiggle of the toe or a, a twitch of the thumb, right? These non-functional movement goals, those are true goals. And most patients uh, can then stay positive, optimistic because they've achieved these micro goals. Dora, since it's a self-pay program and you don't have to worry about insurance, do you actually have written goals? And how does that work? Yes, so we do discuss goals. Um, It's important to work towards something. So at the evaluation, we establish goals just like in any other setting and we work towards the goals. We don't do progress reports every three months or every 10 to 12 visits like you would see in other settings because we are a small group here and we see the clients a lot, we know them well, but we definitely work towards goals, specific goals. Well, another question that I definitely wanted to make sure we got in, Pete, before uh, we Mm -hmm. wrap up, let's talk big advancements in neuro rehab, Doro. So you, like me, we we know evidence-based stroke review, Dr. Teasel, EBRSR, right? We know what the research talks about, which is considered beneficial. And then we know what's considered mixed and, and inconclusive, right? So we know there's a lot of great things. Things that we know for sure, according to meta analyses, constraint induced movement therapy, clearly beneficial. Task training, clearly beneficial. Mirror box, mental practice. Um, we can go on with uh, some of the ones that are clearly beneficial. And guess what? Those are clearly affordable, right? So patients can go home that day using excellent proven techniques. Where are we going to be 10, 15 years from now? I mean, maybe it's going to have to take 75 years, but I want to hear from you first before I make a few comments, where are the advancements? And more importantly, if it's a true advancement, there's listeners that are going to be listening to this that actually are going to want it. So let's also break either the bad news or the good news regarding accessibility. So one of the latest technologies that's out there is the brain computer interface. Um, It's becoming more, we see it more and more on the market, but it's still not easily accessible. Not a lot of systems, hospital systems or settings have this type of equipment yet. It's still in the, let's say it's in the rehab state, uh, in the research stages and early clinical use stages. We've used it here 
we love it. We see the benefits of it. Just the whole mental imagery, visual feedback, tactile feedback. Awesome. Could you, you do it? Share with the group real quick. Sorry for interrupting. Yeah. What is brain con computer interface and, and what does a session consist of or how does that work? Because you, you, people do hear BCI. There's many, you know, from prosthetic devices with BCI right. to robotic devices with BCI. So if you can just do a quick, you know, Reader's Digest, layman's Yeah, I'm going to try to yeah, keep definition. it simple. So basically, you wear a cap that reads brain signals, and you're asked to activate certain areas in the brain. And if you activate them correctly, then you will get feedback through, for example, eSTEM, it will lift your wrist up or you will see an avatar on a screen that is moving. So you're basically learning to control something with your mind in hopes of building those neuroplastic changes and brain recovery. Right. And what we've seen is it's pretty amazing so far. But again, a lot of these things you could do at home. And that's where we're hopeful that we as therapists, we will provide some guidance we want to see our clients, obviously, we don't want to be out of work, but there's so much more they can do at home to progress even faster um, and better. You know, the visual imagery, listening, just listening to a guided imagery session or visualizing something that you love to do, the mirror therapy. I mean, all those components are included in the brain computer interface, but you get the feedback of you're actually activating your brain. So it actually right. shows so, you that you're activating it versus you're visualizing it and you're hoping that you're activating it. Yeah, I really like that feedback component. Is it nice to have or is it must have is a key question. Now, obviously, when we think about delivery models and right. we think about stroke survivors, there's no way that they're going to have a BCI device anytime soon unless someone can figure out a way to where it costs $200 and patients will have the average median household income is $50,000. So this again is my gripe with where are the research dollars going? Correct. And should we come up with more practical ways to, to allow clients to have this type of evidence-based technologies? I'm a big fan of the future of BCI, but I'm very skeptical regarding how long will it take to be accessible to clients? And the other argument to be made is let's do some research on comparing technologies, right? Yeah. So if we already know CIMT, task training, mental practice, Mirbox is, is beneficial. Why can't that be the home run package? And do you need anything else? Now, of course, there's going to be other things we'll throw in. Research can't answer all questions, right? We as clinicians like to throw the whole kitchen sink at patients because they do react. Every stroke is unique. Um, I love doing ESTEM. And, and believe it or not, ESTEM is inconclusive with many studies. I'm a big fan of that. I'm a big fan of strength training. So, so I agree. B, uh, B, uh, BCI definitely is one of those that is nice advancements. The other one, Dora, I want to get your feedback on is I keep hearing about digital therapeutics, right? So every time you uh, go online or go to Amazon or, or check your feeds, someone's wearing a wearable to track something, right? And so the patient can move. What's your thoughts about the future of digital therapeutics? And let's separate that from virtual reality because that's a whole nother podcast. Right. Um, what are your thoughts? Do patients come to you with these different wearables? Um, Where's your mindset with that? Of course, accessibility is always an issue as well, but I'd like to hear it from you. So far, our clients, the, there's not many wearables that they use other mm -hmm. than like an Apple Watch or a Fitbit for step counter or uh, heart rate, those types of things. You know, those little clicky things when you go into the movie theater and they, mm -hmm. they click how many people have walked into the theater. Sure. So we've actually given <laughs> clients those little clicky things to count their repetitions. So I love yeah, the clicky I've, thing. If they had something, you know, that would count your wrist extension continuously, could work great for some. Mm. Is it a necessity? Yeah. I don't think it would be, you know. Right. I think we can and be old school and get the same results, you know, paper and pencil and you count it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so I'm kind of like you, and then I'd love to get Pete's feedback on this from a health and wellness standpoint. I'm, uh, I think, well, by the way, that's where I think it's more popular. Uh, I'm like you, though. It's, it looks pretty, but for stroke recovery, it's messy, right? Because most patients have limited movement. Most chronic survivors, we talked about the Brunstrom stages, they're stuck in those spasticity stages. So as much as we want to put a little sensor on their wrist and forearm so they can track opening and closing, most patients can't even open their hand. So how is Correct. that going to work, right? How Correct. are you going to put sensors everywhere, get them yeah. to follow videos, 
when they yeah. can barely move their arm because they're in a synergistic pattern. You know, I, I think if we carve this out and say the high level stroke survivors, absolutely. Let's get wearables for them. If they want to track reps, if they want to track shoulder movement, perfect. That's good for the 15% of stroke survivors, maybe 20%. For the vast majority, man, we got to augment movement somehow. We got to lift their limb. We got to somehow force, you know, get them to open their hand through some type of external um, design, whether it's Easton or spring-based. Mm -hmm. So I still struggle with the success of uh, wearables. And do I think there's a room for, a room for them? Absolutely. And that's going to be for the very mild brain injury, stroke survivors, but I the agree. vast majority. You see all those more and more online, all these fun little gadgets to play with. Oh, have you suffered a stroke? Try this new super gadget and play games. It might be fun, but for a couple times, but what does it really do? That's what, I mean, we get those pieces of equipment in all the time to, ch to trial them. And there's not a whole lot out there that we would consistently use with our clients, just because the clients do have to be so high level. I feel like for somebody with a severe stroke needs the basics and the basics can be done at home in addition to therapy. So I think under supervision of an experienced therapy, do it at home and you can do it fairly cost effective. Okay. Yeah, so I, th I think there's a really interesting, your last point so key. And, and Henry, to your question, what do I think? It's... Fitbits and Apple Watches were kind of the bane of my existence in the fitness world. I'm not a fan. And I'm not a fan in general for a couple specific reasons. The old 10,000 steps a day thing is what you need. Um, again, is really, really a big improvement for some audiences. It's absolutely zero change in lifestyle for others. And walking is just, a, it's, it's better than sitting. But remember, people that wear Fitbits or Apple Watches to track their steps more often than not, they're just recording what they naturally do all day, just by moving, right? By going to the grocery store, attending class, mm -hmm. doing household chores, whatever. So they get credit for the things they've already done in their normal day. Now, there are people who are competitive with it. You know, in, in my wife is one with her friends. If she doesn't get her 10,000 steps at 11 o'clock at night, she's doing laps around the neighborhood just to beat, you know, Doris down the street. <laughs> so I love that. That's great. She's wired that way. But Remember, my, my main mantra is they record what you did. And back to your early discussion here in this conversation, Doro, it doesn't show them what to do, right? So right. there's a big right. difference in knowing what to do and recording what you did. Uh, I'm with you. It, it, if, if technology continues to advance that we can pick up very small perceptive movements or the firing of neurons in your muscles that even record, like you said, even um, a visualization rep, if we could record that. Yes, that's beneficial. So I love I love moving towards technology that can record what our our people are doing because at the end of the day, sometimes just the progress of checking the box and saying I did the reps is enough for that mental boost for the day. No, yeah. I might not show any improvement measurably, but if I know I did my reps, that's a big milestone. And then the last thing you said is under the right supervision, right? And I think this is where whatever online tool or therapy as a service. And by the way, we're constantly working on, on those things ourselves at Sabo still requires a personal touch. You've got data, but someone still needs to help you interpret it. And they'd say, Hey, that's great, Henry, but here's what we're going to do tomorrow. So uh, I think there's, we, we want to see technology continue to advance and help this cause, but this is a very personal and you described it earlier, every person's different. So one size technology, again, records what that person okay. did it may not show them what they need to do. Correct. Yeah. I think that's the big, biggest challenge in stroke rehab or neuro rehab, that there's not a one size fits all. And we need to tease out what fits every client and, and package it together. That's exactly right. It may be a combination of different products and yeah. tools and therapies that really ultimately decides the success. Well, Doro, today we celebrate you for OT month. And we, uh, we hope that others can learn from this podcast and learn from you and what you're doing, all the great work you're doing in Florida. Uh, your neighborhood is very lucky to have you. And so um, we're lucky to have you too and, and, and be a part of this podcast. And we thank you for joining us and sharing your good wisdom. Well, thank you so much for having me. It was super fun. Yes. Thanks, Daryl Henry. Thanks again for navigating uh, another episode of the No Plateau podcast. And we look forward to seeing everyone on a future episode. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to the No Plateau podcast. Please make sure to like and subscribe to stay up to date on more stroke and brain injury recovery stories. 
The No Plateau podcast is intended to give you an insight into stroke and brain injury survivors' journeys. Any opinions given on this podcast are strictly the individual's, and we do not suggest that you necessarily hold the same viewpoints as anyone on this podcast. This podcast is intended to supplement stroke and brain injury survivors' recovery journey. Therefore, all content affiliated with this podcast is for informational purposes only and is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health providers with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Reliance on any information provided by the No Plateau podcast is solely at your own risk.